Hello, and welcome back to CST 3130. Uh, so my name is David Gemmes, um, and in this lecture, I'm going to explain the first piece of coursework uh, for this module, which is the price comparison website. So I'm going to give a sort of overview of the project, give some examples of sort of commercial websites that kind of correspond to what you're going to be building, explain the submission process, and I'm going to explain the assessment process. Okay, so as it's a price comparison website. I'll give you some examples in a bit. Doesn't have to be a price comparison website, as I explained, but that's you know the main you know the, the project students typically do for this. Yeah, it's the coursework for the autumn term. So sometimes the autumn terms like eleven weeks, sometimes it's twelve weeks. But the submission is basically the end of the autumn term, and it's worth half of the marks uh, for CST thirty one thirty. So the aim of this coursework is to build up your understanding of Java. So you did the kind of basic Java in the second year. Now we're trying to take that forward with threads and these kind of enterprise frameworks, kind of Spring and Hibernate, and also show you how to kind of build and import packages using Maven, yeah? And also all the other kind of magic source that kind of Maven does, yeah? You can also develop your understanding of SQL, so can talk about normal forms, all that kind of stuff here. Um, a few more advanced topics there as well, and also we're going to stick a kind of front end on this using Node.js and, RESTful, and a RESTful web service. So it's a price comparison website, yeah? So the idea is um, you kind of, the actual thing itself uh, allows you to kind of figure out where's the cheapest place to buy something if you're doing this kind of standard price comparison website, yeah? So it hoovers up a load of data from other websites, and then on the front end of your website, you'll be able to search for a particular product, and then you it'll like list all the products that match that. You select the product you want to do the price comparison on, and then you can then link in, then you click on a link that'll take you to the original website where you, you in theory could buy the uh, website itself, yeah? So price comparison websites might, you know, do advertising to support the, you know, the technology they're doing, um, but they don't actually sell stuff usually, yeah? They're just there to provide information to the consumer um, so that they can then um, go off and buy, you know, buy the product at the cheapest price, yeah? Now, there's lots of other projects, you know, run simple price comparisons ones, and I'll say a little bit about some of the other options um, when we come to some of the examples, yeah? Now, price comparison website is done using web scraping, which is sort of a standard technology used when you're doing web stuff, yeah? If you need a load of data, there's basically two ways you can get it, well, two, two sort of ways from the web. You can either scrape it, which means going to lots of different web pages and pulling that data, or you can actually pull that data from web services. So covering web, covering web services next term, this time we're going to cover web scraping, yeah? We're going to store the data in SQL database. Um, we've explored no SQL databases last year. Also going to explore them in the second part of this course. Um, but this time we're going to kind of consolidate a knowledge of SQL databases by using one. We're going to use multi-threaded Java. Uh, again, you know, useful skills there. And there's marks of Spring and Hibernate and Maven. So Spring is used to kind of connect your application together. Hibernate's used as a sort of layer between the Java code and the database. And Maven's like the build system we're going to be using, which basically sort of builds the system, generates the Java doc, uh, packages it up if you need to, runs the tests, all these kind of useful things, yeah? The website itself um, will have a back end as well, which kind of links, which will be implemented using Node.js. Um, if you break the technology rules on this, you'll get no marks for whatever you implement in the wrong technology, okay? So please read the course note description carefully and implement this using the right technology. So we've got a REST API, that's basically, I'll explain that later in the course, um, and you can either kind of, uh, uh, what am I saying here? Um, yeah, it's gonna be in integrated in your front end using Ajax anyway, so it doesn't, the second, second part of the sentence doesn't really matter, just ignore that, yeah, you're gonna build a REST API that's gonna be hooked into your front end, yeah? Your front end's gonna be written HTML, CSS, JavaScript, no surprise there, don't, please don't write an app. Um, and the as usual, quality and quantity of data you've scraped will matter, as well as code quality, unit testing, front end, website, and so on and so forth. I'll go through the marking criteria in a little bit, yeah? So the Java must have multi-threaded, uh, must use the Hibernate framework, the Spring framework, and be built using Maven. We'll store the data in SQL database, website node backend. If you ignore this, um, you'll lose the marks, okay? I hope that's clear. So this is the architecture. People get a little bit confused about this architecture. So I hope this diagram kind of help here, yeah? So the center of the architecture is a database, okay? And it's just gonna run locally on your machine. If you really wanna use a cloud database for this, just talk to me and I'll have a think about it and it's probably fine, but just please talk to me first, yeah? But by default, this will be just some database running on your local machine, yeah? Then we have our, our Java program here. 
So in, a, in the real world, um, this Java program would be running in the cloud these days, right? We'd have a, like a Lambda function that would be triggered you know, every five minutes or so. It would scrape all the websites, update the prices in the database, and then go to sleep for a bit, and then be triggered again, and go to sleep again, yeah? But because we're doing this as a sort of, you know, as a project to kind of learn, to kind of teach you stuff, this Java program here only has to run locally on your laptop, yeah, or your computer, yeah? So when you press the green button, the IDE, or, you know, run out of the command line, it will run, scrape all the data from the websites, and put it in that database, yeah? So don't worry about trying to implement that as some kind of service or, you know, incorporating into the website somehow with a, you know, some kind of content management system type thing. Uh, it doesn't matter, yeah? It's, you can just run it locally and it'll take the data from third-party websites and put that data into the database, yeah? So the job of this Java program is to fill this database and for the moment, it's fine if that Java program runs on your local computer, yeah? So it pulls the data from all these third-party websites, put it in the database, and then another program completely separate um, is exposing that database as a web service, like a RESTful web service, so we can go to different paths to look at, you know, comparison of products or details about a product, so on and so forth. Um, and then the front end, using, you know, Ajax, you know, like Fetch or, you know, Axios or whatever, is pinging that web service to get the data and then displaying it in the front end. You can welcome to use Vue or React or any of your favorite kind of framework for, for doing that stuff, yeah? Okay, so, so third-party data pulled by Java program stored in database, completely separate, back end of the website, implemented Node.js, connecting up to the front end, which then talks to that and exposes and shows the data to the user, yeah? There are some marks for making a pretty website. It's worth making a pretty website for the purposes of putting it into your CV, but don't, you know, spend half the project making it look pretty, okay? As usual, I'm not worrying about cross-browser compatibility here. It's important, but it's not what I'm teaching, so just make it work on a single version of a single browser with a single screen resolution. Like I said, don't worry about putting it on a remote server. Again, you know, if you're going to implement this properly, you just put it in the cloud as a Lambda function, and then you kind of run it from time to time, you know, with some kind of trigger. But uh, here, it doesn't matter. Just demo it on a local machine is completely fine. And, you know, don't panic about minor bugs, yeah? As usual, we've got the laboratory sessions, Q&A sessions. I'll do some, like, exercises related to this. We'll have some live coding demos. You're welcome to ask questions, as usual. There's only, you know, 22, 24 hours of lab time this term. You're obviously going to have to work on this own, on this on your own, um, you know, and then come to the labs with your problems, and they can help you solve them. Yeah, don't try and ex don't expect to get this all done in the time in the lab time. Yeah. Okay, so this will be kind of made a little easier if we look at a few examples. Yeah, so Google Shopping, I'll, I'll show these types live, so I'm going to spend time looking at the screenshots of them. It's got things like Google Shopping, DLO, Price Runner, um, and then Prime Location. Um, I should also, so let's just, let's just run through these examples and then I'll kind of, you know, show you, yeah, uh, where are we at? Okay, here I think we are, yeah. Okay, so, the, so I'm going to show you Price Runner because that's the one, this is my default example of a price comparison website, yeah. So here we've got the kind of home page. So when you're thinking about your wireframes for your proposal, when you're implementing this, you really need almost certainly three pages, three separate pages for this, yeah. You're going to need like some kind of landing page, okay, and you don't need to put all this kind of, you know, stuff on the landing page, because obviously it's a commercial website, it's got its own requirements. What you really need on a landing page is a search bar, yeah? So on the search bar, I use iPhone as an example, even though I don't actually like iPhones. So we search for some kind of term using the search functionality of the website, yeah? And the important thing here is it doesn't give us the comparison straight away, because we don't quite know. I've searched, searched for something quite vague, right? And so there's lots of different products that match that. There's like iPhone 1, iPhone 2, iPhone 3, blah, blah, blah. And then there's within that, you've got iPhone 64 gigs, you've got iPhone 128 gigs, and so on and so forth, yeah? So, so it gives us a, a set of products that match the search term that we've entered. So this is page two of our application, yeah? So if we choose what we want, iPhone 13 and 28 gigabytes, somewhat arbitrarily, uh, you don't need to worry about all this functionality. Um, you can just display the exact products on the previous page. So now I've clicked through, this is page number three, onto uh, the actual comparison part. And then here you can see I've got a list of websites where I can buy that phone kind of sorted by price. Yeah, so, you know, Amazon's cheap as usual, right? And then we can go up and if we really want to spend more, we could go to wherever this is, uh, JD Williams, you know, sell us 749. So this is what people use these, these price comparison websites for. They search for the product they want, they look on there, and then they see if they can, you know, if the matching product, you know, if they can find it, you know, where they can find it the cheapest, yes, yeah, so they can buy it for the cheapest price, yeah? So that's the sort of three stages, okay? Landing page, search results, and then the price comparison page. And then your web service has got to support these sort of the search result part and the price comparison part, yeah?
And you might have several. This might be pulling data from a couple of paths on the web service. Yeah? Now, Adilo, I'm not going to bother showing it, but it works exactly the same way. Google Shopping works exactly the same way. Now, some of the other options you've got um, are every year, one or two, three people do uh, property search comparisons, which is fine. So here the, here the model is you enter a postcode, right? Uh, like, you know, Walthamstow, for example. Um, and then, you know, then you get a list of product uh, properties in Walthamstow. And then if you want, you can add some kind of criteria and stuff as well. Oh, yeah, I should have mentioned, by the way, this pagination is one of the marking criteria. So I don't know if they're actually good at statistics and stuff. But you've got to have pagination on the, uh, probably on the search results, actually. Yeah, here we probably, well, it's just in scrolling pagination. But some kind of pagination needs to be implemented properly um, to get the full marks, yeah? So property search. Um, here we have just two pages. We have like the landing page and then the search results page because the difference between the iPhone, right? With the iPhone, you have a single product like the iPhone 13, 128 gigabytes that's available on five websites because you can be comparing five websites. So in that case, you've got single product available at different prices on different websites. But with property search, it's a bit different because you only have a, uh, this, the product usually only appears at a single price, probably only on one website. You have an estate agent selling that particular property. So I'm not expecting to kind of do a property search and then click on it and see the, you know, Hainault court, you know, available on five different websites at different prices. Yeah. So this is, you still got the scraping component, but you don't need to have to show links to lots of different estate agents. There'd only be a link to a single estate agent when I click through and see this property. Yeah. So if I pick this property, Maybe you can show a few details and you click through and you can see the estate agent. Yeah? I haven't got a nice demo here, but sometimes people uh, also do, I think I had hotel prices someone did last year, which is quite complicated. Talk to me if you're thinking of this kind of project because you've got all kind of date, kind of location combinations. It's quite a little bit tricky. Another thing people uh, do sometimes is kind of flight prices. Uh, so you might want to try and, you know, scrape like British Airways and, you know, Ryanair and so on and so forth and then display, you know, comparison of flights. But, Again, can be a little bit tricky that, um, but but doable. Um, so that these are another couple of options when we think about. Yeah. Okay, so those are the sort of things you're going to build. Okay, um, so that's that's basically the project. Um, and here are the components of the submission. Yeah. So deadline for the proposal end of week three. You got a it's like ten percent of the marks, so five percent of the overall marks. You've got to do the proposal document as well as a a text file. You can tell you the SQL commands that are used to create the database, okay? Zip them up together and submit them in the course website. Now, the first three weeks of this course are all about thinking about what price comparison webs, what, 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 what project am I going to do, right? Am I going to do a property search? Am I going to do a price comparison website? And try and, when you're choosing this, think about maybe focusing it down a little bit, yeah? So don't try and do, I've had a lot of people think about doing kind of grocery comparison websites, but groceries are too vast a category and quite tricky anyway, yeah? So you want to maybe narrow it down. If you think about groceries, we'll maybe think about, I don't know, uh, maybe not cereal. That's possibly a bit narrow, but maybe dairy, for example. Dairy is a little bit complicated too. You need to talk to me about that. But maybe like a wine comparison website, right? Because it's like the same wine might be sold on like multiple different websites, yeah? So, or if you want to do uh, like whether you want to do phones or some people, people often pursue, they've got specific hobbies, and they might be interested in doing a price comparison website around that. Yeah, so you might have last year had someone do a price comparison on guitar effects pedals, right? Because he was really into like guitar, playing the guitar and like music and stuff. Or you know, people do like keyboards or camera equipment. They've got a specific hobby, then it's all you know quite often a good idea to base it around that because it's a bit more interesting for them. Yeah. So you need to figure out which kind of which products or set of products you're going to do comparison on. And that's what this kind of brief description is about. And then when you're doing the wireframe sketches, bear in mind you know, the sort of three stages that I explained for a standard price comparison website, and maybe just two stages if you're talking about property search, or maybe three, you know, if you need the property details and stuff. Yeah, but think carefully about how your project's going to, how your website's actually going to work. Then you need to figure out the websites and the URLs that you're going to scrape. Yeah, and this is kind of part of the sort of first one or two lab sessions. Yeah, you need to, I'll cover this in the lab, but you need to kind of look at robots text, see if they're going to allow you to scrape. And maybe actually write, you know, do a little few tests to see that the data is actually there and we can pull the data out. Because obviously you need to find a place where you can get that data. Otherwise, the whole project's not going to work. Yeah. So a list of the URLs you're going to scrape. Only need five. Um, and then design the database. And obviously I'm going to help you with that as well in the lab. Yeah. Marks of the quality must be Word PDF. Right. There's a database SQL. Um, so this is a file containing SQL commands used to create a database. So I should be able to open this file in a text editor. 
And I should see things like create database and maybe the foreign key stuff in there as well. Yeah. You can just, you can just, the easy way to do this just dump is create the database using ID or whatever tool you're using and then do a dump of that database, you know, with its offered database structure. There won't be any data in there at this stage. Yeah. So the final submission and the autumn term. So as I said, some, they've recently made this, made terms 12 weeks, but that may go back to 11. But anyway, whichever is the last week of term before Christmas, the end of that week, that's the submission date, yeah? So this is the main sort of marks for this piece of coursework. We've got four components, the project report, the source code, the database dump, and a five minute video demonstration. Zip this all up into a single file, submit on course website. The limit for uploads is 100 megabytes, yeah? And so if you follow my instructions and you don't include node modules, and you keep the video to five minutes and follow the instructions and recording the video, then you won't have any problems at all uploading it within that 100 megabyte limit. But if you ignore the stuff about node modules and you ignore the stuff about, you know, how to record a video properly, then you may have problems uploading and then you maybe need to go and revisit the instructions, yeah? So project report just has some screenshots showing the website's key functionality, all your pretty gooey stuff. You can describe the website, just briefly document the different aspects, including the RESTful web service. If you want to document that, you show the different paths and then the kind of do adjacent documents that are returned by it. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, what else we got? Uh, yeah, the web scraping architecture maybe a little bit. Diagram of the final database design and then document the test. There's like unit testing in the Java and JavaScript. So obviously if you want the marks for that, you need to show the unit tests run. So you need to screenshot of Maven or, you know, whatever you're using, Mockachai for the JavaScript, um, showing that the test results are actually, tests are actually passed, yeah. The, Project report must be in Word or PDF format. Please don't include screenshots of code in the final report. I'll knock at least one mark off if you do that. Yeah, don't, I've got the code. I don't certainly don't need screenshots of code in the final report. Now, the most important part of your submission is obviously the source code. And as I've stressed in the introduction to this module, this is not a, these are not trivial pieces of coursework, right? So you need to do all the, so this is gonna have all the Java stuff, right? So we're using Maven to build it. Maven's based on a file called POMXML. We'll all come to this later. Don't worry if you don't understand now. Um, so you need to submit your POMXML. Spring can be configured using uh, annotations or it can be configured using XML files. If you're using XML files, make sure you submit them. Hibernate, again, you can do with annotations or configuration files. So if you use those, so make sure you submit them. You've obviously got the Java source code for website scraping, Java source code for the unit tests. Java API documentation is another requirement that you generate the API documentation for the Java. And then you can have the Node.js JavaScript source code, JavaScript source code for the unit tests, and all the front end source code for the website. And maybe there's some other stuff like view files and so on and so forth, yeah? The source, all of this should be exactly what I need to run your project should I be inclined to run your project, yeah? Um, so no more and certainly no less, yeah? Please don't include node modules in your submission. It probably just make it too big to upload, yeah? And if you do want to submit a jar, the only jar should be the jar with dependencies that's built. Um, don't bother submitting third-party jars or anything like that, yeah, if, you, if, you, if you've got them, yeah. Now, database dump must include both the SQL for creating the database, like create table, blah, 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 as well as the data in the database. You'll lose marks if it doesn't have the data in the database, yeah. You can export it in Heidi quite easily, and I'll show you how to do that, or tools like MySQL dump do a great job, but just a little bit more, you know, fiddling around, getting it to work on the command line, yeah. Must be readable in text editor, yeah? Don't send me binary files because that's not a proper database dump, yeah? Oh, it should be able to open it, can have like the extension SQL or even a text extension is fine, but I should be able to open it up in a text editor and read it, otherwise you're not gonna get any marks from it, yeah? And please read it, yeah? I can't number the times that people have submitted database dumps without checking them and they're either empty or they're missing the data or they're missing the kind of create commands and so on and so forth, yeah? Check it before you submit it or most likely it'll be missing important stuff. Video demonstrations, so we introduced these during the pandemic, but I think these are quite a good way to actually demonstrate your project. So we need to see your project running, yeah? I'm not gonna, you know, undump, you know, restore your database and then run your scrapers and fiddle around with bugs in your code and so on and so forth. You need to show your project working so that I, so that I can give you marks for it, yeah? Otherwise, the assumption is it doesn't work, yeah? So there's a separate video explaining how to record your video demonstration. Take some time over this, make sure it's less than five minutes, if you don't submit a video demonstration of your project, you're gonna get zero marks. And if you don't show stuff working in that video demonstration, you're gonna potentially only get half marks at most um, based on a code inspection of what you've done, yeah? So please look at the talk on video demonstrations in the online section of the course website. Uh, I think it's called Blended Learning now. Um, follow these instructions and make sure you kind of 
apply the right kind of uh, use the right file format, compression, so on and so forth. Yeah, your video will probably be max 20 megabytes, which is fine for the upload thing. If you don't follow the instructions, you use some kind of weird kind of uncompressed file format, it could be like 500 megabytes, which you're never going to be able to upload. Yeah, so please follow the instructions of the talk. And, and, and do your best to show us the functionality of your website, the scraping, the front end, so on and so forth, because that'll enable us to accurately mark your project. That's the important, that's what this is there for, yeah? So don't just do this as a quick afterthought, five minutes before the deadline, you know, leave an hour at least to kind of record this properly and do it all properly. It can be quite a fiddly video, but, but if you follow the instructions, use the OBS Studio, it's really not that hard, yeah? I'm not expecting professional quality videos, right? It's kind of slick transitions, but just something that accurately documents your project, yeah? So please watch that video, and then that'll hopefully help you, you know, get it about right, yeah? Right, so there's submission links on the course website. It's pretty easy. Obviously, that's broken or down or something. Drop me an email before the expiry of the deadline, yeah? So there's usually a six-hour window for submitting your projects. Um, and if you pass that window uh, and then email me, then I won't believe that you've actually done it, yeah? So, so upload it to OneDrive, share me a link, share a link of OneDrive, Google Drive, whatever. You can always submit it by email, even if it's a big file. Um, but if you fail to submit it at all, and then contact me a day or two later and say the website's laid out to down, then forget it, I'm not going to give you the marks, yeah? You must contact me within the submission window if there are problems with uh, my learning or whatever, yeah? Okay? Have a look at the submission and marking video, because that explains how you get feedback. So all the feedback for this is done using online marking forms. You need a couple of clicks to access those. So watch those videos, uh, watch the video, that video, to understand how that works, yeah? Okay, yep, I think that's about it on that. Okay, so hopefully that's enough on uh, what it is and how to submit it. How will we assess it? Well, obviously we'll read your project reports. Always read the code. I always read the code when I'm marking stuff. I'll run some of the code. I usually run the Maven stuff to see if it's building and generating the jar files correctly and running the tests. And I'll watch up to five minutes of the video demonstration, yeah? Then we'll mark the project out of 100, scale it down to mark between 0 and 50. It corresponds to 50% of the overall mark for the module. Okay, it's pretty straightforward. So the crucial thing about the marking of this project are the assessment criteria. Yeah? If you want a good mark for your project, you've got to read those criteria. Yeah? You probably, or you'll end up using the wrong technology, you'll end up building the wrong functionality. You cannot possibly do this project without reading the specification of the coursework. Yeah? I strongly recommend you mark the project yourself. Just go through each of the features that you've implemented, look at the assessment criteria. And what I often do with students is in the labs, we'll sit down and say, well, a week before the deadline, there's no point in asking you five minutes before the deadline, right? Because it's too late, yeah? You need to give yourself time to correct it. So if you sit down maybe a few days before the deadline, let's say, then we can go through each feature of your project and I give you some feedback and we, I can say, oh, you know, you forgot the appropriate Java doc comments, that's four marks, if you put those in, you know, I recommend, and so on and so forth. I can work with you to get a better mark for your project, but that only is gonna happen if you ask me for help and ask me for formative feedback and if we actually have a conversation about that in the labs, yeah? So there's a spec uh, with the uh, assessment criteria in it. So these are the assessment criteria. Um, I've blanked out the dates because they change each, each year, obviously. So read these carefully, right? So this, this is pretty what I've kind of been through already, right? So the proposal has got a description of the website, screenshots, list of the URLs you're going to scrape, database design, commands to create a database, and, you know, make it look professional, right? These proposals are to help you so that we know that, you know, have a conversation about it, Make sure your project's actually going to work, that your websites are scrapable, and so on and so forth. Um, but also, it's about learning how to produce professional quality documents that you might give to your boss, professional documents you might use to apply for jobs, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So you know, put a cover sheet on it, justify it. You know, make, you know, make it look nice and tidy. Make sure the wireframes are presentable. Make it look like a proper document. Yeah. Because there are, you know, it's an important life skill to be able to produce professional quality documents. Yeah. This is Java components, so it's multi-threaded, okay? So you should have multiple threads running simultaneously. Each thread should be dedicated to a different website. So it'll scrape the data, maybe sleep for a bit, scrape the data, scrape, sleep for a bit. You'll find with websites, sometimes they specify crawl delay. So websites do get uh, denial of service attacks when you get uh, like, uh, you know, programs just hammering them with requests so that they can't respond to other requests. If you hammer them with lots of requests, they'll basically block you. You won't be able to access them anymore. So you need to sort of be polite, right? You ping them, get some, get some of the HTML, wait a few seconds, ping them, get some more HTML, so on and so forth, yeah? That's what's called a, a crawl delay, yeah? So, so you need to be polite with your website, and that's why we need threads, so that the threads can sleep, request data, sleep, request data, and so on and so forth, yeah? It's also a very important skill within Java, yeah? 
then Mavins, the build system we're going to use for this. So Mavins, fantastic, right? It'll download all the third-party libraries, it'll unit test it, generate Java docs, and so forth, yeah? So I'm expecting you to use Maven, okay? Must be able to run the unit test, it should be able to Maven test, and it should work. And Maven should be able to build a jar file with the dependencies inside it, yeah? So I'll look inside that jar file if you submit it, or I'll just run Maven and see if it does it, and it should have all the third-party libraries inside, um, inside that jar file, yeah? Spring is used to connect the application together, uh, managing just dependencies. It's like a kind of Java bean approach. So you know, you welcome you. So you have to use this five marks for using Spring. Uh, five marks for using Hibernate as a sort of layer between the Java code and the and the database. All this is covered in subsequent lectures. And then I'm expecting you to scrape data from at least five websites. Yeah. If there's special requirements or special limitations, then have a conversation with, with me in the labs. It should be at least two or three. But, and if it's if I've given if it's like an iPhone, let's say I know there's five websites that sell them, so I'm expecting five websites there. But if you're doing something more specialized, I don't know, uh, industrial machinery or something, maybe there's only like two suppliers of it. Yeah. So so just talk to me, and if I give you permission, then it's fine. But if I don't give you permission, then expect it then download data from five different websites. Yeah. So I'm expecting the data to have at least 500 rows. This should be pretty easy. That's like 100 products from five websites. Yeah, then that'll easily give you 500 rows. Um, so you know, don't don't be don't limit it too much is what that's saying. Don't you? Don't try and just do iPhone 1328 gigabyte comparison website because then you'll have like 50 rows or something. Yeah, at most. Yeah. So so you know, make your product category broad enough so that you can get at least 500 rows, but not so broad that the project becomes impossible. Yeah. Should at least be two tables. I think to do phones properly, you need like three tables. But again, I'll, get, I'll help you in the labs with your database design so you can come up with something that will work, yeah? Database normalization, so it should be a proper design uh, as at least the normal form. Um, data cleaning, so again, um, you know, if you should be able to identify that the same phone is being sold on different websites, yeah? Otherwise, you can't do comparison, yeah? You can't figure out the price for an iPhone 13, 128 gigabytes on one website and the price for an iPhone 13, 13, 128 gigabytes on another website and merge those two together to do the comparison, then you can't actually do this work, this uh, project properly. Yeah? So that's what it means by eliminating duplicates. It's no good just to pull all the data and then list all the possible phones without the comparison element. Yeah? You need to merge it so that you know it's the same phone on multiple different websites. Yeah? And there's various SQL naming conventions. There's a couple of links to documents on that. Just follow those and get those marks back. Yeah? So putting a REST API, I'll explain what that means, but that you know, in a later lecture, but that basically means a web search. So you have uh, different paths, of course, and it will provide you with different blobs of JSON, basically. Yeah? So you might have a comparison path, which gives you a JSON with all the kind of comparison prices for a certain particular product, yeah? Um, so it could be a separate web service, but it's kind of, I'm not even sure, you know, it's a separate website this should be integrated in front end. It should change the description next year, yeah? So just ignore that part. So it's a REST API, yeah? Right, product display. Okay, so... So the front end should work a lot like uh, Price Runner, except with better with proper pagination. Okay, so the user front end, some kind of search bar, user search for products. Then it displays the matches for that search. Okay, um, then you should be able to click through and then see the see a particular product and then a list of uh, products, a list of uh, URLs, and then uh, as well as the prices. Yeah, so the iPhone 13 and 28 gigabytes. You know, will be available at different prices from different websites. You should be able to click into the third-party websites to actually buy the product if you wanted. Yeah, and some kind of pagination either on the search results or you know potentially on the uh, price comparison page. And probably the search results would be the sensible place to put that. Yeah, seven and a half marks for being attractive, easy to use, so on and so forth. You copy the price runner model shouldn't go wrong. I said different, different, uh, what different? Uh, you know, if, you, if you're doing something different like a property search website then you know, just make sure it's as easy to use as commercial solutions, yeah? So it's five marks uh, for Java testing, five marks for JavaScript testing. If you want those marks, you must include a screenshot of the test results in your project report, yeah? Because otherwise, because if you don't prove that those tests pass, I'm not gonna run them, um, so I'll only give you half marks unless you prove that they pass, yeah? Now, a really important point here is they have to be meaningful tests, yeah? I don't care about tests that check that one equals one equals two, one plus one equals two, right? It has to be testing the actual code in your actual application. Or with Mockershire, you can also test uh, the RESTful web service and make sure it returns appropriate things, yeah? So meaningful tests, otherwise you're not gonna get any marks for them, yeah? 
Java code quality, uh, Java, so Java naming conventions, API documentation with Javadoc. That means putting appropriate Javadoc comments. It's like slash star star and then finishing with a star slash. Because if you don't put the right comments in your code, you can't generate Javadoc, uh, your Java documentation You know that, that means anything. Yeah? It'll just miss out all the comments. Yeah? So you must put the right comments in the code and then generate the Java doc and submit the Java doc with the uh, with the rest of your you know uh, submission. Yeah, and obviously JavaScript code quality and project report screenshots showing the website's key functionality. Describe the project, document the web scraping, rest of web servers, how the JavaScript scans data, that kind of stuff. Diagram showing final database design and submission and the SQL file must contain both commands to create the database and data from the database. So as I said. Um, I'm, you know, we're more than happy to provide formative feedback in the lab. Yeah, formative feedback means you show us some stuff, and we say, well, maybe it's going to get those sort of marks. So we're not actually marking at that point. We're just giving you guidance on how to get a better mark. Yeah, so feel free. Best best way to do this with this project is quite sort of complicated, and a lot of sort of working components is to actually come to us in the labs like the week before the deadline or the same week as the deadline, a few days before the deadline anyway, and show us your project, and we'll walk through it. And, and have a look at it and can give you proper formative feedback on it. That's the best way to do it. Rather than, there's not much point in submitting your project to us by email or something, because then we'll, without running it, we really don't know if it works or not. Yeah? And running this, this stuff, as you can guess, is kind of complicated. Yeah? Uh, but about something I should mention, I probably should have mentioned earlier, is it's a web scraping project, and web scraping depends on uh, a third party and a certain way in which they've designed their website. Yeah? So sometimes the third-party website changes just before the deadline, for example. In that case, don't panic about it. Just put in your in your report, um, you know that you know the website was working. Maybe you've shown us to shown it to us in the labs, but then they've changed the design and therefore the web scraping doesn't work. Don't panic and feel you have to completely re-engineer like one of your web scrapers if they do happen to change it at the last minute. Yeah, talk to me about it if that happens. Yeah. Um, okay, so. Talking about draft of course, like I said, with this course, I think it's probably easier just demoing it in the labs, yeah? I don't give extensions, hardly at all, almost never. Um, I never listen to excuses. If you really have a problem, there's the extenuating circumstances policy, then I'm more than happy to you know, have a conversation, direct you to that. But it's only if you've been, you know, uh, had your application for an extension processed by the university itself that I'll actually, you know, take into account, yeah? So please don't come to me and say, I'm running, you know, I'm ill or, you know, I've got these issues. If you've got those issues, completely take that seriously, pass you on to the extenuating circumstances team, but don't, don't come to me with that stuff because, you know, let me know for sure. And please don't make excuses about, you know, oh, I lost my laptop and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you're responsible for backing up your data, as I mentioned previously. So don't, don't, don't come to me with that kind of stuff, yeah? Just hand your coursework and time, plan your work and so on and so forth, yeah? By all means, contact me if you run into problems. But don't expect me to give you an extension, okay? If the course looks late, we'll give you zero marks. What I usually do, and I'm planning to do this year, is because the submission system is a little flaky and gets overloaded at deadline times, um, what we do is have like a six hour window within which to submit it, yeah? So if you submit your course, so the deadline's usually four o'clock in the afternoon on Fridays. Um, if you submit your course at like eight, that's fine. If you submit your coursework, uh, I think it's coming with four or six hours after the deadline. Yes, yeah, it's, it's six, yeah, six hours after the deadline. So if it's like, if it right, comes in at like 9.59 p.m., that's fine. If it's like 10.01, zero marks, okay? So this is a window to submit your coursework. It's not extra time to do your coursework, yeah? So if you start to upload at like five to 10, you'll almost certainly get zero marks because there is, it takes time to upload for all the files to get into the system and blah, blah, blah. It needs to appear as submitted prior to 10 o'clock on, on that day. And that's why we've got this six hour window. So I strongly recommend you start to submit around the dead, submission deadline time for five o'clock, and then you'll be fine. If you submit just before the deadline and see this is an opportunity to do extra work, you'll almost certainly fail and get zero marks. And I will give you zero marks if that happens, okay? Right, so as I said, I don't accept excuses. Um, the correct thing to do if you're having, you know, serious personal difficulties, which do occur, yeah, I understand people get ill, family members get ill, and so on and so forth, yeah. So if you're having personal problems that interfere with your studies, you know, please apply for extra time to complete the coursework and you won't get a mild penalty, yeah. But what you have to do is through this mechanism here, the extenuating circumstances mechanism, it's a dedicated team, there's a form you fill in, you upload some documentary evidence, um, and, then, and then that evidence gets evaluated by this team, 
and then they'll either give you an extension, you know, like a couple of week extension, whatever it is, or maybe a longer extension if that seems appropriate, yeah? So you must uh, apply for, if you do have these issues, by all means, I'm more than happy to discuss these privately within your office hour, but what I will eventually do is probably direct you towards this mechanism, okay? So this is the correct way to apply for extra time to, to complete your studies, not to email me directly, because I can't do anything about it if you email me, me directly. Okay, so plagiarism happens a lot, unfortunately. Um, if you copy another student's projects, I may or may not report you to the university. I may just give you zero marks. Uh, if you copy code from the internet, probably just give you zero marks. And, I, and I've caught a lot of people. Um, so, don't, you know, I mean, I'm not stupid, right? I, I can usually, you know, make a pretty accurate call. I know a lot of the student GitHub repositories now. So, you know, if you just copy some project from a previous year, I'll just catch you and I'll give you zero marks and you'll probably fail the module, right? And then you'll be in a reset situation where you have to try and do the coursework again by yourself without any support. And really, it's going to go badly and it's going to seriously compromise your degree, yeah? So I strongly recommend if you've chosen to do this course, you've chosen to do a hard course, and so you need to seriously engage with it and do the work and then you'll learn the skills and, you know, potentially get a job in this area, yeah? So please don't do this, yeah? Um, because you'll just get zero marks, yeah? There's more sort of links about plagiarism, the coursework description, module handbook. I think it's pretty clear, you know, in this context, this coursework will play plagiarism constitutes. But if you're worried about it, I'm more than happy to have a conversation with you in the labs. If you think you might overlap with something or you accidentally think you copied something, just talk to me and I can give you some guidance, okay? Now, this is a tricky one. I've seen this quite a few times as well. This sort of blurry line between copy and collaboration, right? I strongly encourage you to kind of help each other in the labs, give each other support. Um, you know, and, you know, if you're having problems in getting Hibernate running, you know, give each other a hand. That's all cool. Love that kind of co collaboration, right? That's what the labs are there for. Yeah, you're all in a single room, some of your mates, and you can help each other out. Great. Yeah. But please don't cross a line where you start collaborating on a single project, which you submit as individual work. This is individual work in course in, in uh, this module. Yeah. Two pieces of individual coursework. Yeah. It's not okay to kind of build a single bit of coursework and then pretend it's like a slightly different, you know, compar price comparison website. You both, you know, like it's, it's like one, you know, you change like a little bit of details in the front end, but basically all the Java code is the same, all the website scraped to the same, all the scraping code is the same, yeah? If that happens, um, what I'm going to do is divide them up between you, yeah? If the projects are too close together, yeah, too, too, too similar, yeah, um, then I, and so then I just divide them up between the component, between the people who submit it, yeah? So suppose a project gets a mark of 60% and near identical versions are handed in by three people. I have seen this several times, yeah? So in this case, each person's going to get 20%, not 60%, and that's for the parts of the project that are identical. So if all the Java stuff was identical, then it basically uh, gives zero, you know, divide the marks for the Java between those people who submitted it. And um, But if the front ends and the RESTful web service are different, then they could still keep those marks, yeah? But just don't do it, right? It's it's you know you're going to lose a load of marks and compromise your ability to get a, you know good grade for your for your overall degree. Yeah. So please read the coursework one description document available on the course website, um, and everything kind of is in there basically. Yeah. Okay. So this works to describe coursework one price comparison website. It's quite a fun project. All this kind of web scraping. And it's particularly fun if you pick something that you've actually got an interest in. Yeah. So if you're really into, you know, photography equipment, you probably know a lot of websites already. And, you know, then you can like do a really nice comparison website and more, you know, and put it on your CV, right, as well, yeah? If you really, if you pick something that you find really boring, then you, this will be a really boring project, yeah? So try and find something you've got to lead at least a little bit of interest in, yeah? So please read uh, the, the coursework description document available on the course website. Everything is in there, including the marking criteria. And those marking criteria are going to help you get a good grade, okay? That's it.